how you were able to stand up for yourself in like not combat that's that's way too violent <laughs> kind of combat it because it's like that's how it feels like within yourself access denied access denied Access Denied. Hey y'all, it's your host Jessica Jordan and I'm here on Access Denied, the podcast dedicated to helping you get over your fear of rejection one episode at a time. Let's go! Hey y'all and welcome to another episode of Access Denied. I am so excited because today I am joined by my friend Rachel Bender. Rachel is an Instagram and TikTok content creator who makes videos about her life as a nursing student while also sharing key information about important topics and issues impacting women and the disabled and chronically ill community. I am so, so excited to be talking about our experiences as disabled kids growing up in the US education system, as well as touching briefly on the importance of climate change education and preparedness for the disability community. We have some really important conversations in today's episode, so I hope that you guys will listen up and enjoy. Let's dive in. Rachel, welcome to Access Denied. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited. Oh my God. Thank you so much for coming on here. You are such a ray of sunshine. Oh my gosh. Let's go. (laughs) Oh my goodness. So you and I, we met in Washington, D.C. earlier this year at the Creators for Repro conference, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that was such a joy. I just remember, remember like seeing you across the room and I was like, I think you had pink hair at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, she seems cool. I want to speak to her. How do I be her friend? And now we are friends. And I love that for us. <laughs> Bro, that's so cool because I was like doing the same with you and like I feel like I'm always the one that does that with people and like people are not the one, the people that do that to me, you know what I mean? For sure, yes. (laughs) Uh, But I did do that to you because I was like, she seems cool. She seems like my people. (laughs) Yes, that's so cool. And I know immediately when we met, like I could feel the, the vibes of like, she understands, understands, like not just at a surface level, but this girl's like, she knows what it's like. She knows what it's like to be disabled. <laughs> Alas, I do. <laughs> and oh. you do too. Um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our first interaction was actually at the check-in desk for the hotel. Oh my gosh, yeah. And I remember I was so stressed in that moment because I was the guy was like being a little weird behind the desk. He was like, I need your credit card. And I'm like, why? Why, why? do you need my credit card? I don't know we were having like a thing and then you walked up and you were like looking so cool and like I was like oh she seems interesting and I was like but I can't deal with that right now because I'm dealing with this and then I was like oh she's gonna hate me because (laughs) I was just like acting insane here and I don't know (laughs) real no literally I think the cool thing about like um like this area where we met like kind of that area of social media like um activism type stuff is like just people most of the time are not going to be like clicky and weird you know what i mean so like we're just like people like like i'm going like i'm going to college to be a nurse like i'm just a girl really (laughs) well i think that's a great segue actually i would love for you to introduce yourself tell everybody who you are what you do what 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 makes you you perfect so I'm Rachel. I'm 19, but I started social media when I was like 16. I mean, we could go back. I was in like musically days, but that's too far. Um, <laughs> so I have always um, found a way to express myself, whether it was through like crafts in the hospital or like videos on musically. And Eventually, in like 2020, in the pan- during the pandemic, I got like really bored and I started doing a lot of reflection. And this is kind of where a lot of my creative ideas came to light. Like the doing the accessibility at Peppa Pig theme park when I was in my wheelchair most of the time. Um, I was just like, I don't know, so it, it bred something in me. You know, the, the isolation bred something. And so, I started raising awareness for invisible disabilities because that's mostly what I was going through during the pandemic is like, I mean, in all my life, but like the pandemic amplified how, you know, when you can't see what someone's going through, nobody is going to know like 
or care or ask really what you need and I started just raising awareness around that like and so mostly the issues that I have for illnesses are autoimmune and um, that's mostly what my audience is based of is like people my age with autoimmune conditions since they were smaller and who are just trying to find their way in life despite like access issues everywhere that I mean mainly are gonna affect like the most marginalized communities but affect us too so I aim to try to get that barrier broken so that other people with um, I guess you could say more severe disabilities um, can just have the easiest time of all if that makes any sense oh for sure I love that so much I think that's what a great advocate does right they they use their platforms they use their their um, spaces to try to not just make their own lives better but also impact like the greater good and try to help everybody within a community and I think you do a really beautiful job of that um, having only known you I know for a few months now and like followed you for that whole time I think your content really serves that group uh, very well in a very and, and you do it in such a fun way too and I think that needs to be said because disability can often be like this dark place I feel like for a lot of people and you bring so much color and light and life to the experience thank you so much like I've been listening to your other like uh, interviews like with um, Sam that, a disabled icon she was so cool and um, <laughs> like she brings light and life to it in such another way as well like through her fashion and like her just like a bad bitchiness like you know what I mean like <laughs> like she's such a bad bitch like like I feel like we all kind of I don't know I I build upon I feel like it takes those type of people to empower me to be able to bring the light that I bring to my community. I think it's so important that you said that because I think community is a big part of what we do online. Um, because I know for myself, when I first started content creation, I very much was not the person I am today. I was not, I would not have been a good advocate when I first started. And mm -hmm. I had a lot of unlearning to do. I had a lot of education to do. And I had a lot of like self-love to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was a lot of that sort of thing going on. And I remember like my influences, like back when I got started, I don't know, four years ago, where um, the disabled hippie, I don't know if you know who that is. Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. I am obsessed with them. I think they are amazing. And they have always been just like, a light for me I think in this space and have taught me a lot Nina Tame was another one for me back in the day she's cool. Um, very cool and also brings like color and both of them do bring color and vibrancy to the space in a way that most modern media does not showcase disability Amen. Amen. but I love that you mentioned Sam Sam's great uh, you're great and one thing that I think is so fascinating about you, you you touched on like you're going to school for nursing and I think it's so interesting because a lot of us creators I feel like are so focused on we're content creators right like our goal is to educate and entertain but you're also doing so through this lens of like I want to have this like I don't want to that's not the word I want to use I want to have this other job I want to have this other career I want to be this person and yeah. you're like taking steps and you're bringing your audience along for the ride of what that looks like as a disabled woman and so i would love for you to talk more about that journey me when you notice that because like recently that's like been such a uh, pivotal moment for me is because i've had more opportunities come up with influencing and i'm like i've been building my platform for so long and i'm like i feel like i'm at this this arc where i'm like I could branch off and do influencing if I really worked hard at it. I have the means and just probably go with it forever because I'm, you know, privileged in that sense and I have the support. Or I could continue, you know, doing my nursing and just like be a normal human being, right? <laughs> like everybody else. Um, so I decided that's what I'm going to do and I'm just going to try to uh, not feel FOMO when I miss out on a bunch of opportunities. Um, because I'm getting an education. Um, I think 
that's been the most difficult part for me but the reason I do it is because you know nobody like not everybody has the privilege to just have that choice to be like oh let me just like maybe just like continue building my my business and just do that like a lot of disabled people they have to get a job and they have to work and they have to find a way through like these barriers and it's awful to try to do so and like in school like in high school I like that's one of the main things I filmed on my TikTok is that like when the elevator was out like it would ruin my whole day and like it's those little things that like I feel like if I was in another realm of the workforce I wouldn't be able to shed light so that my community can also like you know get to where they need to be where they want to be as well no i really respect that and i like several things are coming to my mind um you know something i talk a lot about on my page is representation and the importance of representation and it's all well and good i'm not saying that it's there's anything wrong i god i am a full-time influencer right there's nothing wrong with doing that no but it's so important it is so important but i think the fact of life is like i i, I influence for like lifestyle stuff right i i talk mm -hmm. about travel i talk about different things that make my life easier and different experiences i have i talk about my dating life that sort of thing fitness everything yeah <laughs> um but but the, the thing that gets i think not everybody wants to be an influencer mm -hmm not every person in the world, not every disabled person has this dream of owning their own business and being their own boss right. and having like a platform. And that is so normal and so great. And what you're doing is you're showcasing, you're representing like people who want to go get an education. You're representing people who want to go into healthcare. You're representing people who want to go into nursing. And I think that has so much power because that is, that's real life. That's real life. Mm. That that's not to say what I talk about, like fitness, all that, whatever, Ooh, isn't real life. real life. It is yeah. real life. Yeah. But there's benefit, I think, in showcasing this representation because how often do you see disabled nurses talked about in any public space? Like never. Exactly. But it's so important what you do too, which is so cool that we can like like combine our little uh like Kamala Harris loves to say Venn diagrams. She loves her Venn diagrams. <laughs> um <laughs> Hotties for Harris. Hotties <laughs> for Harris, period. Um, we can combine our little Venn diagrams and show that, like, we need guiding people to motivate, like you do, Jess. And, like, we need those people because whenever I go onto my Instagram and I'm having a bad day, I see you, like, slaying it up in New York City or something. And I'm like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> I'm like, I got this. Never mind, there's rep. I'm like, I can do this. If she can, I can. <laughs> Well, thank you. And I, I'm not trying to detract, like I said, I'm not tr even trying to compare necessarily in the sense uh, or like make it a competition in any sort of way. I think I'm just trying to say like representation in these spaces outside of just like lifestyle things is so important um, because there are a hundred thousand different careers out there. And I know like when I was growing up, I didn't necessarily know what I could and could not do because you just don't see disabled okay. teachers. You don't see disabled nurses. You don't see disabled politicians. And then it's like, okay, well, what what is my career path? What are my options? Right. Representation is powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I guess my question then for you then is, how did you decide healthcare? Like, where where did you decide like nursing was your calling? Ooh. I mean, I've. I don't know. I think it was probably one random time when I was in the hospital and some nurse just like moved me because I thought they were awesome and loved what they did. And I also took, I'm one of those patients that takes interest in what is happening medically. Like I ask all the questions. Um, so I used to want to be a marine biologist. So <laughs> love. <laughs> Right? So I don't know where the flip or the switch flipped, but I think it was one time in the hospital. Um, I mean, 
it was a collection of people. Like I, I think this is an ongoing theme. Is like it really takes a collection of people to get me where I am. Um, you being one that one of them, and like one time, for example, my nurse, my favorite nurse Sarah, she would put like when she knew that I was going to be like direct admitted for my Crohn's, um, she would even if she was super busy she would put little rice krispie treats on my hospital bed in the room that she knew i was going to be in because she knew i loved rice krispie treats and like that and the nurses that like would advocate for me when doctors were being just like assholes respectively just dumb and their egos are you know insane um they would come in and just be like, no, yeah, I, I believe you, I believe what's going on, and they would, you know, call the doctor again and be like, hey, my patient is still really in pain, um, and, like, my infusion center nurses who have been with me, I mean, they've seen me grow on social media and in my advocacy, uh, like, over the past, like, three two or three years and they've been with me like every step of the way every month when I go home to my infusions. They support me and they ask me how I am and they're excited to hear about my life and like that's what I want to do for other people. Like it's just it's so it's so cool. Like I just yeah. It's there's nurses are so cool. Nurses are so cool. They are the lifeblood, I feel like, of the healthcare industry. <laughs> For the purposes you just said, I mean, not only are they doing like life saving work, but they also are making patients feel like humans again in a lot of ways. I feel mm -hmm. like they're bringing humanity back to it because it can feel very, you can feel very out of control when you're in a hospital bed, I feel like. Yeah. Um, and it just like gives you some peace and comfort when a nurse like is kind of that face that you see the most often and they bring such a kindness and such a, a brilliance to it and I just know that you're going to be an amazing nurse one day because your just entire like personality is so calming I feel like I feel like that's a great word for you you're a very calming presence let's go that's so awesome what I hope so okay seriously even that like reaction it was so just like almost like ASMR vibes I was like let's <laughs> go <laughs> I try to hold it back because sometimes I get a little too excited and I got to stop that. Like, <laughs> I get so pe pepped up. It's crazy. Okay. Never make yourself less. Never take it down a notch. That's I what we're working on. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is no such thing as too much, especially here on Access Denied. Be your full, full true. excited self. <laughs> so true. Okay. So I want to hear more about your school experience um, yeah. because, you know, I think... Reg high school and college i want to hear both sides of it because i would say the majority of disabled people probably at least here in the united states will go to high school right mm -hmm. um majority will be hopefully getting that education and so i think learning how to advocate for yourself as a student is a very interesting topic and i would love to hear about your journey with that definitely so ever since i was little i knew you know, because of my mom, I knew my rights. I knew I had the 504 plan in place for me at school. And as you know, you and I, we went to the White House together and we got to see the anniversary of the ADA, which was what kick-started that whole thing where you can have a 504 plan or an IEP. And I think awareness of that is so important. Like if you are struggling because, you know, in high school or elementary school even, like it goes, you know, that's when it starts really, is when you can start advocating for yourself or someone can start advocating for you to get the education that you deserve. Um, like read into your rights, like get a 504 plan. There's, you know, federal laws that say that you are allowed to get an education no matter what that looks like you know the school has to help you the counselors have to help you um, arrange uh, that there's a close bathroom to you or that your desk is um, appropriate height for your wheelchair or like like 
that's the bare minimum like by law and they cannot discriminate against you and no matter what they say like no matter what a teacher or a counselor that's supposed to help you may say like you just have to remember that you have those rights and just advocate for yourself and don't let anybody tell you that um, you don't and carry it through carry it through to college like the I think the main issue that I see is that once you get you know the higher grade level you get the less help or assistance you're going to have because it's the responsibility of advocacy for your needs is going to be on you and as long as you have that baseline of I know I'm gonna need help I know I'm going to need um, resources that is really really incredibly important to take with you into higher education I would love to hear more about your, you, you mentioned your mom, like she was kind of the foundation for how you knew that. Can you walk me through kind of your relationship with her and how she kind of has guided you through your self-advocacy? Yeah. So, I mean, like, she's one of those, like, mama bear girlies, you know? Like, she's always been on my side, no matter what. And that has helped so much because you will get people in the medical field, in school, that are not gonna believe you, um, are gonna say your attitude is, you know, your attitude is fine, so why shouldn't you be able to do this, right? Um, but obviously, you know, that's not, that's not true. My mom taught me that she, you know, I know myself best, and I need to convey my needs, right? no matter what I may be appearing to feel like, it's not always reflective of how my body feels because I've been like, you know, that's what I have to do, to, that's what we have to do to get through. And my mom knows that. And I think if you have someone on your side or if this is like yourself, right? Um, it's important for them to know that you know your body best and I think that's what's always been such a guiding um, such a guiding factor for me in my just education journey and yeah she's amazing she's so cool like she's always working so hard and I love her forever I love that you had that support network I love that she like taught you that not to like take pushback from people and I, I want to get into those stories as well because mm -hmm. I know I'm sure we both have yeah. some yeah. Um, but I just think I, I really want to like highlight like how important it is to have somebody from an early age in your ear telling you like hey no you know your body you know yourself like lean into that respect that like stand up for that mm -hmm. and I think that is a really powerful thing and I am so encouraged that your mom was like amazing with that right she's so cool like she's she's always joining facebook groups like and it's like when i get a new diagnosis or something she's like okay i gotta find the community on this like i gotta see what they're saying i'm like she's kind of like like low-key an activist like <laughs> in that sense like she she looks for the community and she's like well let me see what they're saying instead of the doctors and i'm like girl you are so smart that's a powerful ally right there. Somebody right? that like goes and seeks out information. Yes. Right? Like like from the community. Like she's always been doing this. And I'm like, girl, this is this is why I turned out this way. Okay. Wait, okay, what's your mom's name? Kathy. Kathy, we love Kathy. Kathy's we great. We love Kathy. We love Kathy. We love Kathy. Thank you, Kathy, for your for your advocacy, for your for being so wonderful. Uh, big shout out to your mom today. For real, big shout out to Mommy Bender. So cute. I love this. Okay, getting into something less cute. Okay, yes, <laughs> on the other side of the spectrum. <laughs> other side of the spectrum. Um, you mentioned like obviously there are times where people will push back. They'll be like, "Well, you look fine," or um, "You your attitude seems okay," or "Your your mood seems okay." X, Y, and Z. Insert you're fine 
Mm-hmm. So here, as you feel comfortable, I would love to like maybe have a story or two of your experience kind of with something like that and how you were able to like stand up for yourself in like not combat. That's that's way too violent. But like <laughs> <laughs> next to that. <laughs> I mean, kind of combat it because it's like that's how it feels like within yourself, you know, like when somebody throws out like a literal microaggression at you, it feels like you're battling or combating something like inside because when somebody says you're going up the elevator and you're already having a hard time, a hard day, and there's that voice in your head that's like, oh, uh, you don't need this, you're not sick enough, you know, but you know your pain and your body and your mind are kind of battling. And then somebody, you come up the elevator and some teacher says, what's wrong with the legs? It's like, girl, <laughs> come on. That is not like, like straw that broke the camel's back, bro. Like, don't do that. Don't do that. And then, I'm like, I have juvenile arthritis. He's like, oh, I'm just kidding. Yeah, sure. Sure you are. You were kidding. All right. Yeah. All right. Whatever you say. <laughs> Whatever you say. I don't even remember his name. I wish I did because I would say it on this podcast if I remember. <laughs> and that's the tea. <laughs> <laughs> that's the accessibility. Mm, mm, okay. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. That's so messed up, though, because... That is a microaggression. I, part of me hates the term microaggression. This is a little tangent for the day. Just yeah. because it, I feel like it diminishes... D- d- that was not English. <laughs> it <laughs> diminishes the intensity with which microaggressions actually impact right. marginalized communities. Like, they're huge. Right. Yeah. They're not micro. <laughs> they are not. No. No. They feel, they feel awful. They feel awful. And when you're dealing with it... I, I presume this happened in high school, what you're referring yes, to right here, school. right? I mean, maximum, you're 18 years old. I'm sure it happened before then. But regardless, you're still a child. You're still a kid. This teacher is an adult, a whole adult. I don't care how old they are, how recently they graduated from college, how recently they got into teaching. They're an adult. There is a dynamic there. There is a power dynamic. And for anybody who is older than you and who has, like, that space with you, like, no, I'm sorry. You that creates a problem that does create a problem could you imagine being that old what gets into your mind like to pick on a whole child and this has happened so many times in my life when i was little like when i was in a stroller okay being pushed into school because i couldn't walk because my arthritis was flaring too bad and i couldn't get a wheelchair approved from insurance so we used my stroller and so I had to be strolled into elementary school like shamefully by my grandma and I was in third grade right and you know I'm already insecure but then a teacher comes up again a whole grown adult and I'm like I don't know how old are you in third grade like six or something seven nine 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 yeah I'm nine and I feel six because I'm under the growth curve, you know, I'm struggling to catch up and somebody comes up, a whole adult, and is like, um, aren't you too big for that? Aren't you too big to be pushed around by your grandma anymore? Come on. That just sent me, like, I felt (laughs) rage fill my body (laughs) these are real things that happen to me bro and to so many people and they never get talked about because you just have to normalize them to go on with life and it's like it's not okay and if this is happening to me like somebody with a disability that is like i don't know how to describe it i guess i'm like i find a way to function right could you imagine somebody with a lower functioning disability Mm -hmm. like who's going to stand up for them and i think i mean i know you now and you seem like of like i'm we all have insecurities and all that but you seem like very sure of yourself now you show up in a very confident way online i would say Mm -hmm. um that's not I, i obviously i don't know what's going on in your head and i'm not trying to like put words in your mouth in any sort of way but i do think that like you have the tools at the very least to sort of handle this sort of 
behavior at times. And a lot of people don't. A lot of people in the community do not have that sort of like backbone. And I think that's one reason why I, I, I know I wanted to make this podcast is to talk about these tough things that are actually happening and give credence to them. So people are like, when they're experiencing it, they're not hopefully being like, God, why does this only happen to me? It doesn't just happen to you. It's happening on such a wide scale and it, it needs to be more talked about and needs to be more normalized because that's how we make sure that these things don't happen anymore. Amen. Amen. I'm like, literally, that's why when I saw like, I just, I love the whole thing of your podcast. Like the access denied is so perfect. It's so perfect. And the like the photo shoot you had with like you breaking the chains, period. Like I can't even, it's so perfect. It's so representative of the entire community. And I think you're doing a great job of like, like this is perfect. Just having these conversations and having these people who you have the conversations with share out these conversations with their community. It's just like, it's spreading the awareness all over. And it's so great. Thank you. Thank you. And um, obviously I, I try to have both disabled and non-disabled people on the podcast because I think there's conversations on both sides of it to discuss. And I don't want this whole thing to just be about discrimination either because there's rejection in all forms of life. Um, but at the same time, I think as a disabled woman, like this lens is so particularly important to me and my community. And so I, I am very interested and I think the, like people listening, I think would be very interested as well. Like, obviously, the story you just shared happened when you were in third grade. That's a much different time. But the one in high school is much more recent. What has college been like? Has there been similar experiences in higher ed? Or has it been better or worse? <laughs> Honestly, it's been so much better. Like, even in a community college, I go to a community college. And just the professors are super understanding. Like they 100% abide by my accommodations. They don't question them at all. And, you know, I would hope this is how it is. And I think that is the majority of professors. Um, I've seen stories, but I think really it does get better in college because like, they just, the institutions, they just, they, they respect the accommodations. But I think another thing I've seen that could probably be improved, but is obviously, you know, just infrastructure, I think. Like for people with um, wheelchairs, people who, are, who use wheelchairs, mobility aids, um, that can be kind of a barrier, I think. Um, they don't really, colleges don't really keep up on their accessibility standards as much as they should um, but obviously we've seen so many people like um, oh gosh I think her name's Sarah Todd Hammer I don't know if you follow her she does amazing content of like I think when she goes to like when she went to college I don't know if she still goes she would you know fight for accessibility for like the um, automatic doors and things like that so it's much easier because you're definitely going to be listened to more, I think, and just believed, like, at a baseline. It's really cool. I am really encouraged to hear that. Did you have any concerns, like, having had negative experiences in high school, did you have concerns about that going into college? Was that something that you were, like, worried about whether or not you would have continue to have similar experiences? Was it something that you worried about, like how your access needs were going to be met in college? Is it something that almost, I don't want to say prevented you from going, but like gave you pause perhaps? Yes, yeah, that's a good question. Definitely because I didn't know um, where to start really with like accessibility services or um, I was just, I was overwhelmed because the idea of college is just so overwhelming already. And um, I definitely uh, like overwhelmed myself over not very much because like the minute I talked with my counselor and I said like you have an intro meeting with your counselor you know when you go to college and um, you just 
bring up your needs and they're like yeah we can roll over your 504 plan from high school and they will advocate for you (laughs) if if you you know set up that conversation with a counselor just like they they have a whole um ecosystem of accessibility services and i think just having that at a baseline is so nice like i wish that was in like high school elementary school public school type just having like the accessibility services office you know like i wish that was a thing but it isn't in you know uh primary education i guess that's I agree 100% because I know, you know, in high school, I would talk to my guidance counselors. They were, and the principal, and I think there was usually one or two teachers in my, like, annual 504 meeting or whatever. And that was fine. That was easy. It was what it was. But it felt very much like, all right, we have to get so many people involved. Everybody's schedule has to work out for this one meeting every year where things are really not changing a whole lot year to year, and but we're making it this big song and dance. Whereas accessibility services kind of, they they take the the brunt of it. You know, they mm-hmm. they they are that middleman. They are that mediator in a lot of ways in a beautiful beautiful setting. And I I agree. I wish that was more of a thing in um, uh, secondary and primary education. I think rather than. Um, high, just higher ed because I know when I got to Notre Dame where I went to school like their accessibility services they I can't remember the exact number I was just talking to somebody about this the other day but it was something like a, a fourth of the student body or something like that was utilizing the accessibility services yeah it's a need it's an like yeah. imagine I'm like how many kids didn't have 504 plans in high school that maybe needed them That that's what that made me think because right? I was like there's no way that the principal, the guidance counselors, all of my teachers for the semester are all getting together for like 80 kids of my high school. There's just no way. Right. People like underestimate the value of, don't mind me, I'm just whipping out some thinking putty. Uh, got a fidget. Yeah. Obsessed. <laughs> it's glittery too, actually. <laughs> wait, wait, I love that. Okay, so for anybody watching, anyways. Um, no, wait, continue. Anybody watching, what, what's going on? For anybody watching, this is my thinking buddy. It's really great. <laughs> Obsessed. Um, right? It's so good. Okay, so um, yeah, people are afraid to utilize accessibility services, I think, because they, they think it means that, um, I don't know, that they're less than or something, but no, that makes you cool, actually, because it, it's advancing accessibility for people who really need it. It's like everybody needs accessibility. It benefits everybody. You don't have to be like uh, identify as disabled in your everyday life to utilize accessibility. It's everywhere. Like it's it's made into our um, our like ergonomics in when they make computers and things it's it's like accessibility is everywhere and it's it it benefits everybody like you don't have to you know what I mean oh for sure I'm thrilled that you mentioned the stigma around using accessibility services too because I think that's a really big part of it is because there's so much stigma around disability in the grand scheme of things and what that means and the fear aspect of having disability it, it, it is so fascinating to me how many people will not advocate for their own needs because they're ashamed of it and mm-hmm. fascinating is not even the right word it makes me upset it makes me sad that yeah. we still live in a world where people can't just because that that's a lack of authenticity then that's a that's a something you're doing a disservice to yourself you you Mm -hmm. maybe are not admitting things to yourself you're not comfortable with yourself and that makes me sad because I want people to embrace who they are disabilities limitations whether you want to identify as disabled or not doesn't matter but like 
any sort of accommodation that you need like that's valid we're all different people we all have uniqueness we all have things it can be temporary too i always say i always use the example of like anybody can become disabled at any time but disability is not always like a permanent thing like you're not always going to have an amputated leg you're not always going to have like a stoma like you're never going to always have just something that's going to always be there sometimes it could be as simple as getting covid covid is a disabling thing and sure, you maybe are only going to be sick for a week, but for that week, you're going to be down. You're mm-hmm. going to be down. And you're disabled for a week. Yep. It's not a, it's not scary. It's just no. part of life. Yeah, I exactly. That's such a good way to put it. It, it. That's exactly like you hit the nail on the head with that one. Like, I, I don't understand why. I mean, I guess I do understand the shame around, like, being um, disabled by something um, because I guess kind of like, I guess we as a society kind of perpetuate it and obviously we're breaking those barriers, especially here. Hashtag access denied podcast. (laughs) But like they need to be broken even more. They need to be broken even more because when people feel shame about themselves with these uh, like, you know, everyday issues that they face, that pe- everybody faces, um, it's even more so disabling when you, like, just try to push it away, you know? Accept the help. Like, let's get it to everybody. Oh, I love that. And I think it really will tie in well into what I want to ask about next a little bit and, like, talk about next is, you know, it doesn't, it, it starts with education in a lot of ways because education is the first sort of formal thing that is pushed upon children in this country, right? It's something that it's our one of our great unifiers in this country and it's something I'm so glad that is pushed in the way that it is and as mandatory as it is. I think it's a good thing. That's great. Yeah. But when people do not advocate for their needs in education, it it sets a precedent early on that like, okay, we can't there's shame here, there's something to say here. And then later on in the workforce they're not necessarily going to advocate for their needs in the workforce or in more dire situations which i think is like where i'm going with this is in emergency situations um you know i i know that you live in florida and Mm -hmm. hurricane was it helen or helene helene i I think Helene, yeah, okay, I've definitely been saying the wrong thing, so. <laughs> it's okay, because now we're on to another one. Milton? Is right, one? Milton's right around the corner. Uh, yeah, coming I have in to hot. evacuate, like, tonight. Like, <laughs> after this pod, we're going to pack, uh, I'm going to pack my meds and my soma stuff, and we're going to go, like. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm, first of all, thank you for making time for me today. It seems a bit, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, duh. I was excited for this. Like, I don't, I don't care. Like, we're good. We're chilling. Oh, you're such a doll. Um, but please be safe. If you need to, like, get off the call, please do. But oh, no, we're good. No. Okay, amazing. Um, but, like, let's be real for a second. We're back, we're back to serious for a second. <laughs> um, <laughs> back to it, back to it. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, there's a lot of discourse in the community about the idea that climate change is going to have a serious greater impact on marginalized communities, particularly the disability community, because when these giant natural disasters occur, evacuating as a disabled person, you you mentioned you have to pack your meds, that at least you can pack up. But imagine somebody that maybe has like $30,000 of medical equipment or mobility equipment, packing their whole life up, Get, leaving their accessible home, like there are serious consequences and serious dangers for the disability community that people that are non disabled will not have to encounter. And being confident asking for assistance and seeking out that assistance, and also making sure that practices are in place, accessibility services, mm-hmm. we said it should be in secondary and primary education. There should be accessibility services in several different sectors. in local government in federal government and all of these things yeah let's make it a regular part of our existence as a society yes please because 
who am I supposed to go to? Like, I see little groups forming, which is really great, because that's how action starts. Um, like, and they're, they're advocating for disabled people during the storm. And I can see, like, there's, like, one representative in my area that, um, like, included kind of, like, a hotline at the end of her uh, post for disabled people trying to evacuate. And I think that's a really good first start. It, you know, it sucks that that's all we get, right, as disabled people. <laughs> it's like a little hotline at the end of a paragraph. Like, hey, if you guys need help, just call here. Um, that's really frustrating. Um, I could only imagine, like you said, you know, trying to evacuate somewhere where your accessibility needs are not going to be met. That's a lot of thinking and executive function skills that somebody might not have to plan out. I mean, you don't know, like, to, like, there's so many steps to evacuation and just so many steps to a disabled person's everyday life, right, that people don't think about. And accommodations that we have to use to just shower and such. So, like, who steps in when a disabled person needs to evacuate and needs to get all their meds together and or, or needs to get a week's supply of, let's say, heparin or something and their company is in, their shipping company is in Idaho and it can't get here for like a week but they need it now, like, <laughs> like how can we connect these parts, these fairly common parts of a disabled person's everyday existence and just unify them like, you know, the, uh, like, what are they called? The home care companies, the um, pharmacies, like get them all together and say, hey, when there's an emergency, how can we get these people prepared so that they can like, like, let's give them services beforehand like let's train our community to know what they need in these circumstances because like natural disasters unfortunately as you can tell are only going to get worse and they're already pretty bad um uh so you know like we got to get we got to get something in place like we have to put, we have to put disabled people and marginalized communities up at the top of the list for priorities when it comes to climate disasters because, like, those are the people who are going to be suffering the most. Hundred percent. Also, these climate disasters can be mass disabling events, so mm -hmm. even more reason to address it because as people face more displacement, it will just naturally lead to more disability that's just how that's gonna go i think you also mentioned a really important point is like the planning aspect of it all it you know we we have the weather service that can predict some natural disasters the hurricanes being a big part of it but there's certain ones that have less planning or may make landfall sooner and you may not know necessarily the category until it hits or different things may change and change in or not change but like last minute unpreparedness is not an option for disabled people it just no. isn't no. and it's it can it it, it not it's, it's a very serious safety and life and death issue in many cases so it's very important and i i think it, you highlight it so well and i think to kind of tie the whole conversation we've had together, it really does stem back to education in a lot of ways. Yep. Because yep. It, it, it has to come from a place of not having shame around it. It has to come from a place of like normalizing it from an early age. And I, I love that we've kind of had this arc today in our conversation. Yeah. I think that's perfect because it does come back, it all comes back to education and just putting those ideas out there and um, normalizing it, like you said. and just slay <laughs> just, slay. just slay. slay just slay you know <laughs> just slay <laughs> oh, gosh well we are wrapping up on time here but i do want to ask my favorite four little questions that i ask all of my guests 
So if you're ready, let's dive into those really quick. I'm so ready. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, so music. We love music here on Access Denied. What is a song that no matter how like low you're feeling, how unmotivated you're feeling, or how like sad you're feeling after like potential discrimination or rejection or whatever will always get you back up on your feet and like at least feeling a little bit better. Ooh. Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Rachel, I gotta say, you are the first person to say Taylor Swift on this podcast, and no I just way. need to take a moment. I need to take a moment. <laughs> How am I the first person to say Taylor Swift? Shake it off, girl. Girl, I don't know. I do not know. I do not know the answer, <laughs> but um, I love that answer. <laughs> so good. A classic. I also, a classic. You also have a tortured poets thing happening behind you, and I'm kind of obsessed. So. I do. Yep, yep. I decorated the album cover with stickers. I love. I love, I love Taylor. <laughs> me too. Shake It Off will always be a, a win for me. So great answer for that. Um, question number two, what is something that is in your rejection rescue kit? So when you are faced with being told no, perhaps it's something that you do as like self-care. So it can be either like an action, uh, an item, a product, like what is something you do or utilize that's in your rejection? Rejection rescue kit. <laughs> Ooh, the rejection rescue kit. I think the immediate thing I need to do is just be loud uh, about it. I'm going to be loud to my friends at lunch. I'm going to be frustrated and I let it out. And then later I can process it and make it into something awesome i'm obsessed with that i think that's a great way to like regulate you. how you feel about things just like a burst of sort of emotion yep frustration whatever you need to be you know just you know just let it out and then later you can process it and make a tiktok, make a TikTok. <laughs> feel your feelings feel your feelings allow yourself to feel your feelings yes Yes, feel your feelings first. <laughs> what is something, or what was the last thing you did scared? Ooh. That's a great question, because I'm currently going through exposure therapy, so I've been doing a lot of things scared. It's the last thing I did scared. I think, dang, it's a hard one, because with exposure therapy, it's like everything becomes scary. So I'm going to say this podcast because my OCD did not want me to come on it because it was just, it tries to make me sad. So yeah, I did this and look, my OCD was wrong. Okay. My OCD said that if I got on here, I would like mess it up and be like act a fool. Um, but it was wrong again. So sucks. No, you've been so normal. You've been so great. <laughs> you've been a wonderful guest and I'm so glad you're here. I am. I like, I think that that is so beautiful in some ways though. Like because I, I hope, like, you've had fun. I hope that we've had a good conversation. And yes. That's I always have joy with you, but I totally yes. get, like, sometimes our mental health just is, like, no. Mm -hmm. No. Um, so congrats on still being here and still being your fabulous self. And, like, I couldn't tell that you were scared. I'll be honest. I could not tell. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. It's, yeah. It's just, like. I think that's the cool thing about um, ERP or the therapy that I'm doing for my OCD is that like you eventually habituate to that scared feel feeling and you can do more and more stuff that um, people conventionally wouldn't think is scary. So, yeah. I'm Thanks. proud of you. Like, that's this, amazing. Like, it's so perfect. It was so fun. We talked awesome things. My OCD was wrong. Um, yeah. Do it scared. Wrong. Do it scared. Do it scared. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Final question for you today. What is like a nugget of wisdom that you would like to leave with our listeners today? What's something that you hope that they either take away from this conversation or just something completely different that you think is important for them to leave this space with today? Mm. I'm going to say two things, two little nuggets. I think one to take from our conversation is um, know your rights when you're getting an education. Know that 
the uh, like if you're a U.S. listener, the um, Rehabilitation Act that we talked about um, when we were at the White House, Slay. Um, know that that encompasses you. Um, know that accessibility and accessibility is for everybody. And um, let's see, what was my other thing? Um, I don't know. I got distracted and lost my train of thought. So giving i i feel that it's we're, <laughs> it's giving monday wait it's okay I, I have to say this really quick because i think it's so funny right before rachel and i got on i sent rachel an email with a link to today's like recording session and i completely <laughs> forgot to attach the link and i texted her i was like sorry this is coming in so late i feel really chaotic today and she's like well the link's not there so and i'm like classic awesome so i had to send the email again <laughs> with the link and then Rachel was like I'm also feeling chaotic today I'm like great this is gonna be a great little conversation (laughs) so that's where we're at (laughs) yep yep but we ate it up anyways we did we did and I want people to continue to be able to eat it up with you Rachel so tell people where they can find you what do you want to promote here today thank you um you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Rach Cutie Pie, which is the first part of my name, R A C H, and then Cutie Pie, C U T I E P I E. Um, and um, I would like to promote the Climate Superfund bill. You can sign the petition in the link in my bio. Um, it basically makes these big uh, oil companies that are polluting our environment pay for damages um, because they have the money, um, pay for the damages from these climate events. and. I think that is so important for disabled people. And if you could sign that petition, that would be great. (laughs) Thanks in advance. Everything is going to be linked below, including Rachel's TikTok and Instagram. And then the link to that fund as well will be right down in the show notes. So thank you, Rachel, so much for being here today. (laughs) It has been such a joy having you on. I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Please, please, please stay safe. And anybody listening right now who has been impacted by uh, Hurricane Helene or is about to be impacted by Hurricane Milton, please, please know that my thoughts are with you. We are out here trying to do what we can uh, to advocate for positive change, um, but I recognize that that is too little too late in this circumstance. So uh, sending a lot of positive uh, vibes your way for safety and uh, just yeah safety safety yeah. at this point that's most important yep yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. well stay safe dearie have a great uh, evacuation day thank you I will <laughs> oh gosh I have uh, sending you all the love. oh that say less snacks you're good <laughs> perfect Okay. Have a great day, friend. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Access Denied. New episodes launch every Tuesday, so I hope that you will subscribe, download, whatever you do to make sure you're here every single week. We have so many incredible guests coming on, and I want to say a huge shout out to JP Warner Sound for dropping this sick beat that you're listening to right now. Thanks to everybody who made Access Denied possible, and I will see you next time. Bye!